I'm interested in exploring what you see as some uh, specific ways that um, you seek to show up for young people who may be navigating discrimination or marginalization, often alongside disconnection and loneliness. How do we show up for them? You know, I, I, I say this a lot, but I, I, I live at this intersection of queer, Black, Christian. And a lot of times in when in those spaces, the expectation is that I leave part of my, what part of my identity do I need to leave behind wow. to fit into this space? And I think one of the things I think we, we, it was fascinating that one of the things that Karamo did in the video was he, and my therapist does this to me all the time, even on Zoom, is my, Wesley, well, how are you holding your body right now? Like he, he, he talked about their body language. He talked about, and just like not being aware of our feelings sometimes or not being able to name a feeling like our, you know, our bodies are not going to lie to us. And so, you know, I think we, you know, a lot of this discussion has been about um, having an embodied presence and what our tablets and phones do is take that away from us. So, but, you know, I recognize that you know, entering somewhere like, it's vital for me to bring my full self to wherever I am. So whether that means me coming to seminary, seminary like Princeton, which has not always been a queer affirming space, it's my job. Yeah, as, as a person who's comfortable in my sexuality, it's my job. And a seminary that's not always been uh, uh, an affirming place for black students, it's my job to to sit in those spaces. Um, you know, it's cliched maybe, but representation does matter. Seeing someone, uh, identifying with someone who looks like you and loves like you, um, is absolutely important. But you know, also I have to as I took a class. Uh, also with Kinda Dean. And one of the things that I that we needed that we had to do was ask pastors who pastored them. And so I I found four pastors who I knew to working pastors to identify at who and ask them. And they didn't have an answer, three of the four, because they're just so I'm too busy. So so you know I can't help other people unless I'm doing the work as well. Um and they're they're in a place like Princeton, in a place like New York, in a in Rochester. There there will there will be assault on my queerness and my blackness, and so I need to be in a space where I where I know who I am. So someone can, for I mean that's that's what it took for me is I had to see someone who looked like me. Um, I started a group in New York uh, my last couple of years in New York called. I was at a church and there were a lot of queer black men in that congregation. And I started a group called Queer Black Men in the Middle. It was Middle Church in New York. And basically it was a safe space for queer black men who were interested in spirituality. I'm not, not necessarily Christian, but most of them were. And what I found was, you know, what, what a lot of us don't learn how to do as men is when we're told, don't you cry boy is we don't we we don't learn how to self regulate because there's no one who helps us regulate right and so what i found in those kinds of groups is this there's this co-regulation so somebody might be out here but as a group and i think we've talked a bit about this as a group we co-regulate and and you know when i hear someone say oh when i came to that meeting and i've heard kids in this youth group that i'm working with my shoulders just relax. I'm like, okay, that's that. The, there's a word for that, actually, and that's co-regulation. And I think that that we are, um, man, responsible sounds like a really big word. Um, <laughs> there's a responsibility of for people like in this Zoom call to be that for other people, and in order to be that for other people, you know, I have to recognize my own. struggles you know i i remember when the, i was in new york city when the pandemic started 
And for two weeks, I was so happy. I was like, thank you, God, I can isolate legally. <laughs> like, you know, I don't have to deal with people. And I got extraordinarily lonely after about two weeks. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, how, you know, my, my, my therapist talks about being well-resourced. Uh, am I well-resourced? And am I going to pick up those resources and use them when I need them? And I think um, my my job as a pastor, my job as my job as a human is to be resourced, but also to be a resource to other people. One of the things that I would to add to, to your question about what we can do, one of the things that 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 we've been able to do here and that I've been able to spearhead here is uh, a, a program series that we call Courageous Conversations uh, that allows for these marginalized communities to have discussions in safe places when things are happening on campus, things are happening in the world that have significant impact on them. Uh, and so when uh, the murder of George Floyd occurred, we had a courageous conversation around race in this country. You know, when there were very public uh, and violent attacks on uh, Asian Americans, we had a conversation uh, about what was happening, uh, what was happening there. We've had a conversation related to, um, you know, how members of our LGBT plus community see themselves in this community and what they experience in this community. So I think you know, providing those spaces. And that kind of has been mentioned several times as we've spoken today, uh, safe places and spaces for people to talk, to express themselves, to to be seen, uh, to be recognized and acknowledged is a real important part of some of the things that we can do to help marginalized communities uh, with that impact of, of loneliness. 